welcome to The Olive Tree with me, Julia Fisher. Today I'm talking via Zoom to Howard Bass in Beersheba in southern Israel, where he's the pastor of a Messianic congregation. It's now mid-June and slowly Israel, like the UK, is emerging from the coronavirus pandemic. I asked him to describe what this time of lockdown has been like for Israelis. Well, Israel as a country is dependent largely upon tourism for its economy, for the income into the economy, and all the industry, all the hotels, restaurants, and things associated with that, parks, and even for internal tourism, for Israelis to go out and about and uh, enjoy things in a very special year of good rain and the filling up of the Sea of Galilee. That's also been curtailed. So the economy has been hit hard. And in Beersheba, where we are, with many industries surrounding the hospital, the university, the chemical from industrial industries, that's all been affected severely. And we have a high unemployment rate right now, and many people not knowing what will happen. So it's been very widespread. In our own congregation, we've had some people who have had to be quarantined, not necessarily being sick, simply because they've been near those who have had some sort of uh, uh, signs. So that's happened, even happening right now. Schools are closed again, in Beersheba at least, because of this. It happened in the schools. We have a, an old age home, elderly home, however you speak of that in polite England. Uh, yeah. That's been, In Beersheba, one got very badly hit with about 13 deaths. And so we don't really know how we're going to recover from this. The, the world has changed. There's, there's no question that this corona is a catalyst to other things that are written in the scriptures that need to happen. This is just, I think, uh, a pop quiz to prepare us for a test to come and a catalyst to speed up things because God does have his own schedule. <laughs> he has his own mm-hmm. appointed times and he's going to keep them and he knows how to move quickly. Has it created a lot of fear in the country? Uh, I haven't sensed fear other than people who would have real employment issues, I think, are fearful. I think that'd be very natural. People whose livelihoods, we have one man in our congregation who's also an elder. He's a, he has a tour company. He doesn't know where it's going to lead. He's trying to think of alternatives. He's not fearful. He's trusting in the Lord with his wife you know, and their three children. But it's no question something that's heavily on their mind about how to come through it and go beyond. We don't know what the schedule of Israel's is opening up borders and of other countries opening up their borders to allow non-quarantine travel. Uh, plus the facilities here, again, are in a shutdown mode or very heavily restricted opening of how you can be in one place, like a restaurant, for instance, or a hotel. It's not normal. So socially, everything has been negatively affected, as we are just not having to have, if we're only speaking of virtual meetings, for instance, still YouTube or Zoom or whatever it is, it's, it's uh, socially, it's a breakdown. Mm-hmm. Uh, was were intended to be in physical contact with one another mm-hmm. and in physical eyesight of one another and things like that. So this is a whole breakdown in the society from a very up close and personal uh, way. And how have you managed to keep your congregation together? You mentioned online. Have you been meeting on Zoom, for example? We've had various Zoom meetings, you know, between different groups, categories of groups, or uh, you know, conversations between certain ones that need to speak together and can't get together, or it's uh, just a certain time of day or evening that we just need to let's meet on Zoom. Um, but as a congregation, beyond that, for our service, thank God that we have two or three or four young people who are more familiar with the, you know, modern technologies of things, and uh, they've been working wonderfully for pre-recordings that we'll do for, for, as if we were having a service. We'll do pre-recordings during the week, not always on the same same day. Different parts of it might be on different days of the week. And then he's then we have the one of those persons who's doing the filming is also doing the editing. Then someone's doing the sound mixing for the for the music, for the singing, the mm-hmm. uh, praise and worship time. And then we have on Shabbat morning, Saturday morning, we have on YouTube in four different languages, the wow. same service, uh, encourage the members of the congregation, come together and watch at 1030. 
let's try to be as if we are having a service and a sense of community. And even when we do the Lord's Supper uh, once a month, so now we've done it twice, I think no, three times now, then we're telling people, okay, you have your own bread, your own cup, wine, grape juice, be prepared. And we take the Lord's Supper together, each person, each family, whatever, doing it along with the one who is leading it on the YouTube. So we've tried to, well, we've done very well. I mean, amazingly well, given who we are and who we're not, <laughs> amazingly well to have <laughs> to have this <laughs> going on at whatever level. But people have been blessed around the country when they hear what we've been able to do, and even into four languages. So That's amazing, who, yes. yeah, whoever's teaching or the, and also whoever's leading the the praise and worship, if they're saying something, or whoever's doing the Lord's Supper. Depending on their own languages, they might do it in Hebrew and in English, for instance. But yeah. then somebody else will speak through them into Russian and into Spanish. So we have four separate YouTube videos going on, and we try to get as much as possible the translation up in writing as well. Same thing with the verses or the songs in the different languages. That's a huge effort, isn't it? Yeah, it's amazing. But again, if anything were to happen and these fellows somehow were unable or something else happened, then as far as I know, it drops. You know, it's nothing we can really guarantee. And the longer this goes on, the more difficult. It's many hours involved, as I'm sure yes. you are aware. Yes. And uh, and different days of somebody having to go out and do these things. As, as well as if any of these go back to work or go into studying more full time, that will also take them away from having the time they have now mm. to come together at different times and ways to help put this together. Have you found, Howard, that... Because you have been on Zoom and not meeting physically, that people have tuned in. We found this in the UK, that a lot of people who would not normally go to church have actually been tuning in to online services. Is that your experience too? It is. We have more people watching our YouTube services than we would have only if they came and met together as a congregation, as a church in one place. So we appreciate that. Some of them are family members of people who live in different cities or different countries that are deciding to turn in, tune in. Others are not getting it from their own congregations, let's say here in Israel, and they are hearing what we're doing and they are tuning in, especially if they know somebody you know, in the congregation. Uh, we have pastors tuning in from other congregations in other cities because they are not able to do it, to do it themselves for their own congregation. Okay. So they're tuning into ours. So it's very interesting. I don't know what we'll do in the future once we do begin to get back together, if we can continue doing anything. I'm sure we, we ought to take opportunity to learn to how to use the YouTube or Zoom uh, yeah. once we get beyond. But a live service is still another level of doing what we're doing than it is being pre-recorded and where people can take time even with how to translate and how to you know, put things yeah. together better. Editing and things. So what are you anticipating is going to be the long-term effect of the COVID-19 in your congregation in particular? Well, we have some people with pre-existing conditions and they are more nervous about coming together and they may still be nervous about coming together. We have, uh, it looks like we're all going to be required, I'm assuming, the way people are speaking, of having to have a face mask on, maybe indefinitely. Um, and keeping some distance. Uh, this would be a great, this would have a, a, a huge effect on any mm. congregation anywhere in the world. Mm. And I don't know what the practical answer to that is unless we're willing to get arrested. But then you have other people in your congregation you don't want to, you know, they may choose out of fear not to come. They may simply, again, have some health issues already and are really nervous about coming. Some might not want to be too rigid in how we follow you know, the regulations. Mm -hmm. And personally, I believe that in our own neighborhood, given our own history with the ultra-Orthodox, I'm assuming once we start to meet, they will send somebody to see how we're doing it and what we're doing it and whether or not we're keeping all the rules properly. I'm, I'm sure they would look for a way just to cause us some problem. That's my that's my conviction. I don't think it's unreasonable. You're describing <laughs> You're describing something that sounds quite restrictive. Yes, it is. Until mm -hmm. now, it's very restrictive. Even mm -hmm. though they're allowing some people to go back to work, even though they are allowing uh, uh, some places to open up, some restaurants are beginning to a little bit or trying to, they haven't yet 
made that the same thing for for synagogues, you know, for for church groups. It's, it's not the same regulations being applied. And I think you had that, I'm assuming, in England and the United States. And some 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 believers are protesting why you're making a distinction between what we are, you know, what is good for the society, you know, that believers should come together to worship the, you know, the true God and be praying, but you're letting other people in certain industries, like even tattoo industries, I heard in one of the American states, we're opening up tattoo parlors, you know, <laughs> you know, things like that. It kind of will cause some believers at some point to say, well, we have to, you know, there's, there's going to be persecution in any case. And the, and the, and the scriptures tell us to still try to find a way to, to assemble together. So how to do that when you knowing you're taking a risk and you know it may have consequences and not just be, you know, uh, not be rebels, you know, not be troublemakers, not be disrespectful of the civil authorities, but you're simply showing that your faith in Jesus is requires you sometimes to go out and even touch the leper. You know, if, we're, if we can't even give a handshake because that's a contamination and then everybody is basically becomes suspicious of everybody else. And if I touch you, if I'm near you, if you cough, if you're anything, you might be infecting me with something that would also break down the social, uh, you know, the sociability of people, the whole matter of just being in contact with one another. Love, love will get very Im- more, even more impersonal. Um, it's, it's a, it's a catalyst to worse things to come. And it's, it's, it's not looking good, but the Lord has told us when you th- see these things beginning to happen, you look up because your redemption is near. And we haven't even gotten to that point yet where in the context of what you're saying, that's when he's saying it. But it's telling us these things are going to be happening. You've been listening to Howard Bass, a Jewish pastor in Beersheba, and we'll hear more from him next week. The Olive Tree Reconciliation Fund is a Christian charity based in the UK that supports the needs of both Jewish believers and Arab or Palestinian Christians living in Israel and the wider Middle East. If you'd like to know more about our work and receive our free bi-monthly newsletter, please visit our website, olivetreefund.org. Meanwhile, join me at the same time next week for another story from the Olive Tree. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye.